Well, um, I hope you can all hear me okay. I am just figuring out how to get my screen organized here. Okay, so just keep, okay, there, perfect. Welcome everybody, um, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Suzanne, for organizing this. I'm so happy to be here with you um, and to welcome you to this evening's talk. Um, I am actually coming to you today, as Suzanne said, from Washington, D.C., which sits on the ancestral lands of the Anacostans and the neighboring Piscataway and Pamunkey peoples. And we're talking today about cultural items or museum collections housed in Boulder, Colorado. So before we get started, I want us to think for a moment about this beautiful place we call Boulder, because it's located within the traditional territories of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute nations, and 48 contemporary Native nations have historical ties to the lands that we now call Colorado. We care for and steward items from these Native nations that bear witness to these communities' connections to this place, and our museum endeavors to be welcoming to these and all Native nations. Today we'll be learning about the people in place of Bougainville Island, Bougainville, Bougainville Island, um, thanks to a student's class project, more on that in a moment, and Dr. Noro, our featured speaker. I'm always amazed at how collections can connect distant peoples and places in meaningful ways, and that's the story I want to share with you briefly before Dr. Noro's talk. So I teach a collections research class, um, and in my class, students can select any items from the collection that interests them to study over the course of a semester. In 2015, Isabella Vinson Haler chose Pacific Collections, and she selected the collection of Bougainville. Bougainville. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get there. <laughs> Bougainville. The University Museum historically focused its research and collecting in the Southwest in the United States. So not much was known about this particular collection. The items from Bougainville were collected by Conrad Bud Johnson in 1947. He was a soldier who had attended the University of Colorado and was assigned with the 30th engineers, mapping the islands and trading and collecting along the way. When we looked into this particular collection more as a part of this class, we found a lot of associated documentation like field notes and maps and photographs, and we learned that much of the material culture on the island was destroyed during World War II, highlighting to us the even greater significance of this collection to Bougainville Islanders. We immediately knew we needed to get this information to Bougainville community members. So the next step was making the collection accessible or viewable from a distance. So in 2017, Museum Studies graduate student Jane Richardson digitized the collection, which means she took photos of over 30, 300 items in the collection and updated the database about them so they would be searchable. Dr. Paige West connected me to members of the Kainake Project, which you'll be hearing about later today, Dr. Noro and Junior Novera. And the two of them helped guide us the rest of the way to getting this information back to its community of origin. Jack Piaf, an undergraduate at the time, did additional research and helped us put together the primary source book. Well, that's what I've been calling it anyways, which included all of the images that were taken, all of the field notes scanned and photographs all in one place. And that primary source book with, it's like this thick, um, was sent to Bougainville with Mr. Novera and Dr. Noro's help. Dr. Noro gave the Bougainville primary source book to the Curator of War History at the Papua New Guinea National Museum and Art Gallery and other museum staff, including the museum director, Dr. Andrew Motu. We then, with the help of University of Denver student Manuel Ferreira, now curator at Beloit College, we developed an exhibit to go in our museum in Boulder, Colorado, but due to COVID, it was never installed. Instead, we took the layout Manuel had developed and Jack developed it into an online exhibit with the assistance of Jenny Dillon. This is all to say it takes a village, right? So students were essential to this project along with our wonderful partners in Bougainville, Dr. Noro and Junior Novera of the Kainaki Project. We are a teaching museum. And to me, this project embodied all the things I most want students going on in museum careers to learn and experience. 
the importance of accessibility of collections and their associated documentation, building relationships with originating communities, and following those communities' leads in determining what is the most appropriate and meaningful ways to engage with, interpret, and care for those items in our care. So over the years, we went from student project to community connection to knowledge exchange, which has brought us the opportunity to learn more about this important island and its people and the inspiring work going on there today. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Noro. He has worked as Director for Policy at the Papua New Guinea Science and Technology Council and Secretariat, and is the founding director and board member at the Kainake Project. He holds a PhD in Marine Biotechnology from the University of New South Wales in Australia. The Kainake Project is a sustainable development organization based in Bougainville. The vision of the organization is creating and sharing knowledge to empower people to preserve and develop their natural and cultural inheritance. I love that Dr. Noro's vision um, binds together the natural and the cultural. We see this in the materials and in the meanings of the items in our collection and in collections and museums everywhere. So it has been a pleasure and a wonderful learning experience to be in partnership with Dr. Noro and Junior Novera. And I'm so pleased that we could contribute to the mission and values of their organization and I am even more delighted to turn this over to Dr. Noro to begin his talk. Thank you. Madam Susan and Dr. Zen for, for this opportunity um, to talk a little bit more about, about the kind of project and, and the people um, that I work with in Bougainville. Um, my talk this morning is gonna be on the social and cultural dynamics um, and very much talk about the the historical and um, current perspectives at the moment, but uh, you know, with a little bit more um, focus that we um, on the work that we do with the Kanaka kind of project. Um, I started the Kanaka kind of project in 2014, um, around the time when I was finishing off my PhD at the University of New South Wales, and the the central purpose was really to preserve a lot of the, the knowledge and cultural inheritance that I felt was um, 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 eroding. So, let's see. Um, just a little bit of uh, background of myself. Um, I, I lived um, in Bougainville um, during the height of the, the Bougainville War in the 1990s. And I had a lot of um, lived experience um, that um, experience of uh, living through a war and depending on a lot of traditional medicines. So um, when I came out from, from the Bougainville uh, War in the 19 late 1990s, I decided to um, take up science, science and technology, and really to find like the why traditional medicines uh, work and, and the importance of that um, knowledge. So throughout the years, um, I, I ended a PhD at the University of New South Wales, but then I moved on to work with the government of Papua New Guinea, um, looking at science and technology policy. Um, my talk today is, um, this is just the outline of my talk, but I'm gonna use a story, sort of a telling uh, model as a, in respect to, 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 to my community. Uh, the storytelling is the way that we sort of share knowledge in, in my community. Um, this is where, Bougainville is located. So we're very much um, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, not far um, not of Australia, and westward from um, the University of Colorado. This is where um, Bougainville, um, map of Bougainville. Um, on the green dot is where my, my village community is from, the Kainaka village. Um, it's on the southwest of Bougainville Island. Um, but in my talk, I'm also going to talk about other community um, organizations that, um, that I work with. 
Um, Junior Novarez um, community is found up north, uh, Kunua. And I'll also talk about another community in South Bougainville, um, in Buin. Now, the, the kind of community, um, there are about 300 people that live in Kainaka village. And it is a matrilineal sort of society, which means that women actually own the land. And women are also chiefs within, within the clan system that we have. The, the people and the community are basically live a subsistence living, um, meaning that they mostly hunt. Uh, for their proteins and also survive very much on garden food. The literacy levels um, within this community is actually 90%. Uh, not many people in, in the community um, have the access to education um, as well as technology. Um, other services such as edu um, hospitals and healthcare are very much non-existent as well. So this is um, the, the kind of uh, community that, um, um, that I come from, but also where I have started work through the Kanaka project to at least uh, bring in some of these services and improve the people's well-being. Um, before I, I sort of um, head back into my talk, I just want to talk about the the, the historical events um, in, in Bougainville. Um, archaeological studies have actually found that um, Bougainville was inhabited about 29,000 years ago. And it was only just about 1768 when Bougainville was first um, stumbled upon by, by the French explorer that we had massive uh, colonial disruptions um, to the traditional um, sort of um, way of life um, for the people. Um, since um, 1768, there has been um, sort of um, major establishments by, by the European colonizers at the time. Um, Bougainville became in the 1800s a protectorate of the uh, of the German Empire. And then in 1914, after the First World War and German lost, uh, Bougainville was incorporated to become a, a territory of, uh, of New Guinea under the United Nations um, uh, League, League of Nations in 1920. But this, this event, um, starting from 1768 um, and the late 1800s led to a lot of disruption um, that Bougainville people had with their relatives over in the Solomon Islands. And this event also kind of um, created a lot of tension in, in Bougainville and um, led to a lot of um, events that um, that led to, to the war of the 1990s. But um, I'd also like to point out the, the work of uh, Bud Johnson was in World War II um, in, in 1946. And that's kind of has become the, the, the focus of our work with the University of Colorado. Now, um, I'm just gonna talk about um, the, the most recent sort of, um, sort of um, most recent event in Bougainville. Um, one of the, the motivations why the Kanaka project actually came out to be. So just prior to Papua New Guinea, New Guinea getting its independence from Papua New Guinea, um, the, the administration of Australia at the time, um, they developed a giant uh, copper mine in the heart of Bougainville. Um, which basically um, supported the new country of Papua New Guinea. Um, and in the 1980s, um, it was providing about 50% of Papua New Guinea's GDP. However, um, there was 
um, lack of equity. Uh, Bougainville people felt that um, um, they were being displaced um, from the connected to, to, to the land and accompanied with a lot of uh, ecological destruction that was happening at the time. So this led to, to a bloody civil war that started in 1989 and about 20,000 lives were lost. And what we have here in, as seen as in these images is, um, you know, the, the scared landscape. Uh, and the scared, scared landscape and also a lot of, uh, um, you know, scared people. Um, my father was um, arrested in 1990 when the, when the, when the war was beginning and was um, kept as a political prisoner. And we were lived under these conditions for about, um, pretty much up until 2000. And my experience of, of living through this war and the trauma actually motivated me to, to go back to Bougainville after I finished my studies and work with the community as a way of um, healing you know, and overcoming some of the traumas that I've actually gone through. Um, living in this, in this time of war. Um, thankfully, in, in 2001, after, you know, after more than 10 years of um, war and a loss of 20,000 lives, the, the Papua New Guinea government um, and the Bougainville Revolutionary Army at the time um, came together to, to find for ways to actually stop the war and find um, lasting peace. So in 2001, with the support of Australian government, New Zealand and, and the other Pacific Island countries, we, they, they signed a Bougainville peace agreement. And this peace agreement had about three pillars. Um, one, the first pillar was on for Bougainville to get an autonomy um, state from Papua New Guinea government. Second was to dispose of all the weapons. And the third one was to hold a referendum for independence. So in 2019, the people of Bougainville um, voted 98% um, to gain independence from Papua New Guinea. So that's a, that's a massive um, kind of outcome and dictates the, the wishes of the, of the people to be, to be independent. At the, the, the structure of, of government at the moment are in Bougainville. Um, we have the autonomous Bougainville government as the, as the, um, the role overall government, um, followed by the community governments. So community governments are really the second tier of government um, comprising of different um, constituents that um, have acted representatives in the autonomous Bougainville government. And the third um, tier of government is really at the village level, uh, what we call the village assemblies. Um, the village assemblies are in, informal, informal government, but they are very important because this is where the chiefs, uh, community chiefs actually work. Um, a lot of, lot of the social issues, law and order, for example, are managed at that level um, at the village. This is where about um, you know, 80 to 90% of the population still live. And um, it's such a so sort of an important area of focus, um, particularly when we're looking at um, structures of government. Um, on this picture here on, on, on the right-hand side is, uh, is a clubhouse, um, which we constructed at Kanaka a few years ago. And the clubhouse is um, <clears throat> kind of like a traditional meeting place. And here we have the elders uh, talking to kids and passing on the knowledge, um, passing on the knowledge to them. Um, so, 
this is uh, primarily the area that the Kanaka project is currently focused on um, working right at that grassroots level with the community and the people. And also we look at how we can, you know, diffuse global knowledge into, you know, right down to that level. Um, <clears throat> through, through the work um, that we do in the community, we have also um, we have also found out that there's a whole lot of erosion of cultural values and and principles, and the reason for for this is because we are very oral society, and knowledge is actually passed from you know from people to people, and because of the the introduction of modern economy and jobs, are uh, younger generations are moving away from villages. And when that happens is we're cutting off that linkage um, where young people now are no longer coming and sitting, sitting with their, you know, with the elders to learn from them. Um, also, um, external influences uh, from churches, missionaries, and also the, the mining industry that operated on Bougainville also cut a lot of the a lot of the linkages and the and the knowledge systems. Um, in this picture here is my great grandmother. Um, I don't know what her age is because it's never been recorded. Um, and on the right side, she has a rock. So this rock has been passed on from so many generations past. Um, it's a rock that belongs to my to my clan, and it's usually passed on to the to the elder daughter. And because we are matrilineal society, it actually stays with the women folk. But the interesting thing about this rock is um, when during the Bougainville War, when we were in hiding in the forest and you know trying to keep away from the Papua New Guinea Defense for soldiers, we had to carry this rock on a on a, like on a platform and we took it everywhere that we went. But um, this rock um, remains in the village as a as a symbol of authority, um, knowledge, and and some of this some of the values. So at the at the moment, um, we're kind of working on on codifying and writing some of the this um, traditional uh, principles, which I think will form the basis of another future project, um, especially with with no, um, knowledge preservation. The, the other thing that we're facing on Bougainville at the moment is, is ecological sustainability and climate change. Um, uh, the, the people of Cutbridge Island and Bougainville were the first climate refugees because their island is actually going underwater um, due to sea level rise. And many of these people have to be relocated from their, from their land and it's creating, you know, and loss. Um, a lot of the, the traditional burial grounds are now underwater. Um, and, you know, it's the, the people's connection to land is, is being eroded. It's not just, um, not just the physical um, uh, displacement. The, many of the people from, from these islands have been relocated to, to mainland Bougainville. Um, which also is further causing social issues because in Bougainville, um, about 90% of the land is actually owned by tribes and clans. So, um, you know, with, 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 the, with the new immigrations, um, the, the extension there. Uh, plus the older people also don't want to leave um, the low lying islands and to, to relocate. And I think the you know the issue of climate change is just not isolated to Bougainville. It's a, it's a global issue, and and something that I think everyone has to come together and and resolve. But clearly, when we dealing with displacement of people, um, as I stated, um, education skills um are some major limitations like i said um the, the kind of community when we started 
the project, about 90% of the, the population was illiterate in 2014 when we started. Um, today, we have a lot of the, the young kids now attending school. And we also now are providing skills training um, in, in, in agriculture, uh, food production, and also we're providing some assistance in financial literacy training. And I think it's important, um, you know, to to provide some of the you know global information knowledge back into these communities. Um, so the kind of a project, um, you know, when we started in two thousand and fourteen, we really wanted to align to a traditional sort of government um, in, in a way that people you know kind of were empowered to to make their own decisions so this is one of the first meetings that we started in 2014 um where we have the the chief um uh, you know addressing the community and everyone has the you know they they have no sort of political structure in the village except the chief and everyone else is is equal. So um, and everyone contributes. So this is one of the, um, the the first meetings that we started. And here I'm just going to provide some examples of the work that we've done so far. Um, on the left um, side is a critically endangered um, mammal that's only found in Bougainville. Um, that's we we now currently preserve in a 65 hectare of uh, conservation area. We've also written a book um, on the traditional medicines in, in the community. And <clears throat> the book is written in the native uh, language. Um, one of the one of the things with the with the traditional names of the plants is that they descri describe the functionality of the plant of the what what the plant does so one of the things was that if we had to lose knowledge and the traditional name of these plants we actually lose the whole body of knowledge so it is it's important um you know to also codify some of these things and um the the other thing with um, with, with traditional knowledge is, is really um, important when it comes to conservation. Um, when we were looking for this endangered rat in 2016, I went with a team from of scientists from the University of Queensland. We had all our scientific gear and camera traps and all that stuff, but we were not able to locate this um, rat until you know the. The, the chiefs in the village, they came together and it's like, no, this is this is what the traditional knowledge says. This is what how you can find it. So we had to throw away all our scientific equipment and you know follow what the traditional knowledge says, and we were able to find this um, find this rat. Um, it's um, it's endangered, and currently we through our conservation project we are seeing a regeneration of, of this giant rat. This um, red is also important because um, it, it's found in songs and lullabies for kids, but it also has other uh, medicinal values as well. Um, the book that we've um, wrote uh, on the preservation of traditional knowledge has um, found other functions. And, and I think in, 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 in the Pacific Islands, particularly with Melanesia, you gotta have multi uh, functions in, in, in objects that we have. So the book that we wrote um, has now been used as uh, also as a fundraising driver um, by, by other sort of community-based organizations. And we've also distributed the book in different schools. Um, so, you know, it's just not oral knowledge anymore. It's been, um, you know, it's been written and passed on to, to other, other kids. Um, one of the other things that um, we've been doing since 2014 is building partnerships. 
um, you know, between modern science and traditional knowledge. Um, on the left hand side, we have um, a scientist from from the University of Queensland, um, working with the with the local local um, man in in the forest, uh, and. This is the time that we um, we we actually were able to find it right? I mean, consultation with with this, uh, you know, with, with the chiefs. On the right side, we have uh, my colleague uh, Junior Novera is wearing a blue shirt. Um, again, talking with some of the one of the local men. Um, Junior Novera was uh, he's from uh, another location in Bougainville called Kunua, but he was invited um, to come to the community. Uh, he, at that point in time, was um, starting his PhD, um, and he's just um, finished his uh, PhD and I think done an incredible job, and which I'm, I'm going to talk about his work next. So this is, um, this is uh, Junior Nova's uh, backyard conservation area where he's done his PhD on. It's a massive um, conservation area of about 200,000 hectares, and he is there um, he's from this area and he's working with his own community um, to, to preserve this um, in, incredible landscape. Um, so in Bougainville, again, um, everything that we're doing has to be aligned to the traditional ways, and which means that, um, you know, Junior takes lead in this work. Um, the people make those decisions on what needs to be done. Uh, for myself as a scientist, and even though I'm from Bougainville, you know, I cannot just go into this community and do work. Everything has to be uh, community driven and has to be done by the people from there. But <clears throat> um, Junior just finished his PhD um, and submitted. But his work um, in this area has, um, has resulted in a, in, a, in a lot of amazing results, um, you know, species um, um, being discovered. Um, again, it's another photo from his area. Um, uh, the conservation area here starts from the, the reefs up to the ridge. And at the moment, um, the community is going through a legal process to register this land um, legally and, and also to look at you know, what other opportunities that we can actually, <clears throat> we can find. Um, yeah, the community conservation that I've been working with, through Kana, that I want to introduce it is called um, Kagalalo Conservation Area. And this area is found in the southern part of Bougainville, um, up on, on the hills. And <clears throat> it includes a, a lake that's on the, on the left-hand side. So this lake is uh, is very important because in South Bougainville, um, where I come from, and many other communities, we believe that when we die, our spirit actually travels up to live in this lake. And this lake is um, also supplies all the freshwater rivers throughout South Bougainville. So through our you know, a traditional belief system that, um, you know, when our ancestors go to live up there, they continue to, you know, replenish. They continue to give um, fresh life, you know, into the river systems that continue to sustain our life. So the community up there is also working on, again, through their own community-based initiatives um, to preserve this um, significant uh, spiritual place. Um, you know, so that it's not destroyed and, you know, to the burdens of, you know, economy, you know, like, like you know, forestry and unsustainable logging. So in 2018, I was invited to go up and visit the community and sort of um, establish the, the groundwork on how they can go preserving this land. So I, I took a hike up and on the picture on the left hand side is they gave me a, a war spear as, as a sign of um, respect and trust. And, and I think it's it's really quite significant. Um, you know, the 
the the power and authority that's actually like symbolized in this in this in the spear it can you know the spear is actually you know it can be a weapon but it is also in this instant um in private um exchange you know as, as a token of of trust but i think the one of the things that i want to point out is that um you know if this spear is actually removed from this community and uh place elsewhere uh sometimes these objects actually lose their significance and and the the cultural you know the purpose that they intended for um but i also want to kind of um bring out that in in our traditional way of building relations um is you know it's based on this kind of um exchanges and not necessarily on on you know uh crafted um agreements and 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 all these things um but i think i think this is an area of constant sort of um evolution that we need to find ways on you know when we're making trust-based partnerships um how can we also you know correlate this to modern ways of um, agreements and uh, relationship building um this is an example of one of the one of the outcomes that we've had up in the Tagalalo conservation area is um this is just a post from the um from national geographic um of our, one of our latest discoveries in a new species of ant and this is a work that we did um, with um, with University of Mexico, um, you know, also supported by the by the local communities. Um, so I think to conclude, um, to conclude, I just want to say that there, there there are new challenges and also opportunities, and from the years of um, the past ten years of working in the community. I've um, we've sort of noted that I think um, traditional language is just as vital as the objects that are being recorded, and the people um, that are being depict, depicted. Um, I've just um, I continue to learn a, a lot more about the importance of our traditional language, um, especially when it comes to description of functions of of, of objects and plants and animals. Um, the other thing also is that some of the data that um, that we at Kanaka Project have collected over the years, um, sadly, sometimes they don't really translate into anything, you know, it's just data. But I think when you have like a lot of gaps in terms of literacy, um, there's some difficulty in connecting, um, you know, meaningfully what data can mean. So we're constantly looking at ways on you know, on how do we translate some of these things, information into tangible outcomes that people can feel and touch. Um, yeah. But also, um, you know, I think there's a personal obligation to actually acknowledge the, the past, um, the present and the future. And, you know, I think we need to think beyond ourselves in the present. Um, and finally, while a lot of these um, actions um, were all like driven locally, um, you know, at a lot of um, as personal interest, particularly like for myself and June Nova and many others, I think I think these are important um, practical examples of how communities can can do things and preserving their culture and environment, um, but also at the same time building trustful relationships. You know, like what we've um, been able to achieve with University of Queensland, the Australian National University, and now with the University of Colorado in, in terms of the, the book project, that I think there's so much more to learn from, from each other. But um, moving forward, um, Juna and I have been working with the Bougainville government to actually include some of this experience into Bougainville's policy and legislative frameworks. So, you know, these are not just sort of uh, community actions that are happening in isolation. But, you know, they, they, they can make a positive impact. 
in the future. Thank you. I'm you know really really happy to share share this, share this with with everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I think you can stop sharing your screen. And what I'll do is invite our guests that if you have questions, to please place them in the chat, um, and we will happily um, read them aloud. And I thought I would ask um, about kind of where you ended your talk, which was so intriguing about this idea of having this kind of work rise to the level of governance and policy. Could you tell us a little bit more about what that would look like or what the emphasis would be, what you would be looking for in policies like that? Yeah, I think, yeah, the, 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 the major the major component in terms of policy shift is really in um, in terms of empowering the the eighty percent of the population you know the 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 the, the grassroots the, the areas that we've been working in because I think much of the much of the tension and conflict um, you know as we have seen in the past is when we have government and organization and industry that sort of pushes from the, you know you know top to down without listening you know without having dialogue so i made a policy shift that we um because what we found out is that this actually works is when you work together with community in a sort of non-confronting way when you listen a lot and you you work together i think positive things can happen and at you know as local initiative, you don't need anyone else from elsewhere to, to tell you what to do, you know, you own these resources. So I think the major emphasis on this policy shift is really to, to build people up, to, to provide the right tools, education. Because, you know, as you've seen from the, from the maps, Bougainville is actually very rich, not just in terms of its mineral, but in terms of its resources, we got the land there. Um, but, but we need the know-how, we need the tools, we need knowledge, we need technology to actually translate, you know, to, to add value to these resources that we have. So a, a lot, I think um, that's kind of the shift that we're um, looking at. And we've already submitted a policy information paper to the Bougainville government. So it's a work in progress at the moment. Thanks. Um, I had another question, which uh, which is, the name of the endangered mammal. Do you know what the the name of it is? Um, yeah. So the traditional name of the endangered red is called Kamari, uh -huh. and it's a like you know we use it in children's songs. But the the scientific name of it is called uh, Solomis salabrosis. Yeah. So it's currently red listed under the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And it's only found on Bougainville. I thought what was really interesting, which emphasized that sort of vision for the Kanaki project, was that there were traditional stories that included that particular endangered rat as well as. So as an example of where the sort of the natural and cultural heritage emphasis, you know, can you talk a little bit more of that intersection? <laughs> yes. Um... <laughs> The, like just, just an example with, with the, you know, we spent about seven days, um, seven days, you know, with our camera traps, all this high tech equipment, you know, radio trackers walking through the forest and we couldn't even get any sight of this rat. And, you know, we, we thought, oh, we are signed, you know, we got everything and no success. And then one time the chief sat around and like they had a meeting and then they brought us together and they told us, uh, Jeff, I know you guys, you know, you're a scientist, but um, traditionally you got to respect the forest. You know, when you go into the forest, you talk to the forest, you talk to the spirits. Um, you know, don't go into the forest with a um, sort of a aggressive confronting way, you know, go in quietly. Um, and there are certain rules that you got to follow as well so anyway um 10 minutes less than 10 minutes after we had that con conversation 
we we went and got a first red, ten minutes, and then we got a second one. So you know, like the the issue of nature conservation, but the you know also the traditional belief systems, the um, the rules, um, they they are all all very important. And you know sometimes modern technology doesn't work. You know. Well, we have a, we do have a question here from Rob Kowal that says, "Can you say more about the materials from the Colorado collection? What's the plan for repatriation, and how do you think they'd be received by the Bougainville community?" So, I'll say a couple things about this. Um, I know that some people talk about digital repatriation, but I actually don't like that phrase um, because if the original items are transferred by ownership and control to the originating community. To me, that's not repatriation. So what we did with um, Dr. Norange and Junior um, Novera is we returned information, right? We returned knowledge that had been collected about the collections and the items back to the community. To date, there has not been a repatriation request, um, certainly something we can talk about. Um, but I would love to hear maybe more from you, Jeffrey, about what, you know, what role have you thought about the repatriation of Bougainville collections abroad back home or creating, you know, relationships like this to share knowledge? So what do you see the role of collections in this broader sort of sustainability project or idea that you're advocating for, you know, in, in your communities? Yes, I think um, like that, this is one of the, you know, when I when I spoke about the the policy and legislative framework, is really to you know create the foundation on how we start looking at representation of materials of 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 you know, because the thing is, um, you know, the the missing collections um, that are held, you know, not just at Colorado but all over the world, there are a lot of uh, materials of cultural value that are kept in those areas. Um, at the same time, you know, we just cannot remove all these materials back to Bougainville because, you know, they, they've been collected some over 100 years and they kept in, you know, special, um, you know, with handling and stuff like that. But with the policy that we've been looking at is to start looking at how we, you know, how do we, we, we bring back not just materials, but also how do we build institutions? Because we cannot bring back these materials unless we, we start building the institutional structures and you know, infrastructure you know, uh, for this one. And not just at the centralized location like you know, in, back in Bougainville, but how does that filter back into communities, into schools? And, and this is, again, one of the reasons why that, that we've started writing books and you know, codifying some of this traditional knowledge is to make them accessible in a printed form because of some of the problems I've said that earlier that the, the traditional linkages where oral knowledge was transferred have been broken. So I think, I think the, the issue of repatriation is, should be seen as a long-term process. And while, while, we've, we, while we've got a couple of um, books and stuff that have been you know, given back to Bougainville and also made accessible online, I think these are short-term kind of things. I think in terms of the longer term, that this is where the Bougainville government and the people need to need to start, you know, creating lasting policies to guide some of these things. So this is kind of the next level where we sort of uh, sort of started moving into and having conservation a uh, uh, conversation with the government. Yeah, I know that Australia has had um, a repatriation outreach internationally and we had a discussion with them as well for a very small collection that we had and just amazing that they were able to connect with so many different institutions in the state. So um, another really great example to think with too. Um, so yeah, that's a wonderful question. Thank you, Rob. I'm just gonna see if there's any other questions. Um, sure, if folks have other questions, please place them in the chat. Um, but I would also say, do you see any other um, role for museums either you know nearby or abroad sort of to contribute to this process beyond you know in in addition to repatriation uh, um 
I think that's 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 one of the one of the reasons why you know like in in in, in your present I, I approach the 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 Papua New Guinea National Art Gallery and Museum so that um, it can be actually housed in in a you know in in a sort of um, a, a proper sort of a government sanctioned um, institution there. Um, so that we have a, a, a record on, on, on a central sort of place. But um, there's some, some, some things that are developing in, in Bougainville um, at the grassroots level, where like in the district where I come from, uh, CY district, where Kanaka project is located, we have the local communities, um, every year they do a CY tourism show and there's been a sort of a, you know, grassroots driven museums that are coming up where people are putting, you know, uh, including World War II materials, but also old traditional artifacts. So I think there's a, there is a sort of a re reconnection happening, you know, back into, um, into, you know, into, into cultural and in, uh, like heritage uh, objects. But I think this is um, maybe, you know, in the long term, um, um, these are perhaps opportunities that, um, you know, institutions like museums can actually go into the grassroots, you know, places where people are actually starting to drive local initiatives to, to distant proper ways of collections, making records, um, how to store, store these things. And, you know, and, and just build a repository of knowledge. You know, and, and I think I think these are, uh, you know, uh, things to look at in the future. And, and, and hopefully with the kind of relationships that we're building, and, you know, if we can get policy support from government, uh, you know, maybe something something to look further into. Um, we have two more questions. Um, one is um, from Fife. I hope I said that correctly. It says, you discuss Bougainville's non-mineral wealth, its rich cultural resources, incredible biodiversity and forests. Would you be able to say more about how you think Bougainville can build on these strengths going forward towards independence? Yes, yeah, so um, at, at, the mo at the moment uh, in the community, part of the Kanaka project last year, August, um, we, we started, um, because in, in the years before we, we, we've worked with funders, you know, to, to, to support us. And then we felt, felt that um, there's no sustainability in community if there's, you know, we continually, you know, asking, writing grants and getting funding from outside. Because when that ceases, you know, you're done. So what we've done is we've started developing sort of a kind of business models around, around cocoa and vanilla cash crops, you know, basically. Um, and, and also looking at um, using our conservation areas as, you know, as ecotourism, you know, uh, starting to look into that, um, like, you know, kind of business. And um, we've set up um, in the last 10 months, we've set up a business where we set up, um, like frequency in buying cocoa beans. Um, we're putting a dollar more onto the current value of the, the beans that, you know, that's there. So what we've done is we, we're buying cocoa every three weeks. So we, we, we wanted to establish prediction and consistency um, so that we start changing our farmer's attitude to become more productive and think like, you know, um, more business, but we've been able to um, inject about 20,000 Kina into the local economy in the last um, few months. So we're looking at about, you know, eight, uh, probably 7,000 US dollars into these rural, rural communities. So I'm at the moment um, looking at establishing markets in Australia to, to, to continue to create value back to this community. But um, I think the, in, in terms of your, your question, we, we need to look at trade, you know, trade and partnership building because, um, and 
And that is an area where we need partnership between government. Uh, we also need to work with other countries in terms of trade relationships, uh, you know, diplomacy. Um, we need industry businesses on board. Um, we also need the, the enabling frameworks that would allow, you know, you know, this kind of business to actually to evolve. But, uh, you know, from, from the experience, from what little we've done, it's doable, but there are a lot of uh, regulatory constraints at the moment as well. So I think um, some of these things really need a whole of government approach, you know, to, to create not just the domestic markets, but also the international market opportunities to be realized. You know, it comes down to a whole lot of different uh, factors. But from the little that we've done, I think it's doable. We, we, we can use our rich natural resources and what we have, and, uh, and just our story as well. You know, I think Bougainville has had an amazing experience of, you know, eco-revolution. But how do, how do, we, how do we kind of, um, you know, build on that? Um, well, we have one more question from a guest, and then I have a final question for you. So um, thank you for that. Matthew Spriggs asks, the North Solomons Museum was completely destroyed during the Bougainville crisis. Are there plans to reestablish the museum as part of rebuilding the cultural heritage of Bougainville? Yes, um, I think, you know, this, this is a very good question. Um, um, unfortunately, because um, I'm, I'm not in government, um, to actually give a clear answer to that. Um, like I, I work basically just in a community level, but to be honest, that's something that I think um, people in government should really, you know, push for. Because I think museums, they, they have an important role to play, not just in collections of the past, but also future. I think, you know, museum, museums are also important for science and technology as well. You know, I think I think these are places that um, knowledge is kept, and it should be prioritized. Um, so, just again reflecting, um, sort of going back into the policy proposition that we've done. Um, this is one one area that we would like to push for government to to you know to actually prioritize. You know, <clears throat> um, so the, the policy information paper was submitted last December. Um, so the Bolivian government um, has already approved the enactment of it. So I think it's in the process. So hopefully through some of these conversations and also discussions with government, we could, um, you know, reestablish, you know, a, this, this kind of key institutions. Well, um, I agree with our last comment that your work is incredibly inspiring. Um, and <laughs> Just so lucky to be, again, I'll say it again, like in partnership with you and getting a chance to learn about all you're doing as a model for others to think with and support. Um, so I guess my uh, question at the end is just, you know, we've recorded this, we're gonna be sharing it widely. Is there anything else that you would most want a broad audience to know or understand before we wrap up? Yeah, I, I think, um, <clears throat> yeah, I just want to say that, like, you know, we currently, you know, we, we're in a world that, you know, we, we're in a world that's talking about uniformity, you know, like, you know, with technology and connectivity, everyone's like, you know, um, we, we, you know, there, there's this movement, you know, the cultural shifts, you know, you know, everyone's still sort of sifting in, into into this new 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 place driven by technology. But I think we also must also learn to respect this this uniqueness. You know, the 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 uniqueness of of, of culture, of people, of place. You know, and and you know, I think just the the diverse of experience. You know, of different people, and I think I think. Um, very important and we need to listen to each other you know and I think I think the world can learn more I think there's a lot of voices out there some are loud some are soft 
you know, some uh, dim, but we, we need to keep an, keep an ear out. And there's so much, so much more to learn from each other and, and keep, um, you know, building relations, like, you know, important for the future. Well, I'm just going to really quickly share my screen before we um, conclude today. And this is just for anyone who wants to learn more. So um, basically, uh, if you want to learn more about Dr. Noro's organization, that's kainakeproject.org. Um, we also have a Facebook page called Bukenfeld Museum Collections Abroad, where the entire primary source book is actually downloadable as a PDF. It's really big. Um, and then the online exhibit, Sincerely Bud Johnson. Um, you can find all of that if you look for my project page. I've got all the links there. And um, we're just really uh, so delighted to have shared this afternoon for folks over in the Pacific and evening for the rest of us with you, Dr. Noro. Thank you for taking the time to share your work with us. Um, it is truly inspiring and I really appreciate you bringing um, your thoughts and experience to, you know, the folks that are engaged with the University of Colorado and hopefully um, as we share this video out with a broader audience in Bougainville and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you to Suzanne for um, organizing this today. I'll go ahead and close out the meeting. Thank you everybody for coming along for the ride. Have a wonderful evening and afternoon wherever you are. Thank you.